Hello, welcome everybody. It is a wonderful honor to be here with you all today for this event. Thank you for your reactions. I'd like to offer a deep congratulations to Etzel Cardenia, who has been selected to receive the PA's 2020 Outstanding Career Award. And this is why we are all together here today. This award goes to a PA professional or associate member to recognize sustained research or service contributions that have advanced the discipline of parapsychology. Professor Cardenia has been the main editor of some of the very best parapsychological books of the 21st century. The Parapsychology, a handbook for the 21st century, Varieties of Anomalous Experiences, Examining the Scientific Evidence, and Altering Consciousness, Multidisciplinary Perspective. He is also the founding editor of Mindfield, the bulletin of the PA and past editor of the Journal of Parapsychology. Etzel Cardenia was born and raised in Mexico. He was elected fellow of the APS and the APA and holds the endowed Thorson Chair in Psychology, which includes parapsychology at Lund University, Sweden. He is also leads the center for research on consciousness and anomalous psychology there. His areas of research include alterations of consciousness and anomalous experiences, including psi, dissociative processes and post-traumatic reactions, the neurophenomenology of hypnosis and transcendent experiences, and the stream of consciousness during waking and altered states. His PhD is from the University of California, Davis, under Charles Tart, and he was a postdoctoral fellow and scholar at Stanford University. He has more than 350 publications, some in top journals in psychology and related disciplines. He has also worked professionally as a theater director, actor, and playwright. I was very grateful to have met Etzel uh, very early in my uh, parapsychology career at a BA, BIAL conference in Portugal. And my conversations with him were deeply meaningful because I could feel his uh, depth of understanding of the field and his insight into the studies that I was thinking about were really appreciated. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Etzel Cardenia to uh, share his talk, Ethereal Art, the intersection of psi, physics, and modern art. Thank you so much for your uh, kind presentation. And uh, let me start. And I uh, see that there are a number of my friends attending. Uh, a client from, from Scotland called Caroline Watt, Nancy Singrone, and others. So thank you for being here. So uh, you have in front of you uh, in a sense, a, an image that synthesizes a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. It is the composition six by Kandinsky, Vasily Kandinsky, uh, one of the most influential theoreticians and artists of the 20th century. And the composition six has the particular quality in his view of being able to affect directly the consciousness of the spectator. And he meant not that the spectator was going to be affected by the quality of his um, abstract composition, but he thought that his ideas were going to be transmitted directly through some kind of Hertzian telepathy directly into the spectator's consciousness. So I'll come back to his ideas in a few moments, uh, but so that you get an idea, in any case, whether it affects your consciousness dramatically or not, it is a very dramatic uh, composition. So I will come back to Kandinsky. And what I want to do in this presentation is really show the various interlacing links between psi physics and post-representational art. Before, though, before getting into the gist of it, uh, uh, let me just, sorry, it went too fast. Uh, let me just dedicate this presentation to my two good friends who uh, died these last two years, Carlitos Alvarado, uh, and a uh, very good friend, one of the foremost 
uh, historians of psychical research, if not the foremost historian, and Rex Stanford, who ended up developing uh, some very important theories and ways of researching that we have not yet explored as much as they should. So I dedicate my presentation to both of these dear departed people. And so to the lecture, here it comes. Here is the outline. Very briefly, I will talk about what I mean by modern art, which is really post-representational art or art that starts appearing at the beginning of the 20th century. Then I will talk about three main principles that ended up informing that art of the 20th century. I will get into them in a moment, but they have to do with the dissolution of matter and the dissolution of the subjective objective distinction. Number two, that there is a hidden order of reality or some kind of ether or interconnectedness across the universe. Uh, number three is that there are multiple dimensions beside the three ones, the three geometric ones, Euclidean ones that we have, and maybe even more than time. And then just briefly talk about artists as seers or, or mediums. And to finish with a couple of images, a few images of Psy as art. So let's start with what do I mean by representational art? This is what representational art is. You, some people call it realistic, uh, but to put it in very crude terms, it is art that seeks to represent something that is seen or received by the senses. So you have first a painting of Millet, and then a painting of Bonnet, and uh, you can easily recognize, even though you haven't been in those particular places, you could say, well, I have seen workers or farmers like that, or I have seen perhaps a woman with an umbrella and a child like that. So those are easily recognizable, even though these are two very distinct styles. So that was the predominant art for a few centuries until we really get into the 20th century. And here things start changing now quite dramatically. So uh, let me start with a quotation by one of the great artists, Paul Klee, 1920. And I know we have some German attendants here uh, who will know his work probably better than I. Uh, but he's, he mentioned that in abstract art, what the purpose is, is to go from reproducing the visible, as we had just seen in representational art, to making the invisible visible. And uh, I, I will get to Hilma Clint. Uh, and uh, what does he mean by invisible? Well, what is felt or what is intuited and as we will see sometimes, even what is communicated, what is experienced as being communicated by spirits or something like that. So here we have first the very famous scream by Edvard Munch. And you know that is, even though you can see, well, it's sort of a bridge. There is a figure there that could be sort of human-like, but then the landscape, is much more, I think, how one might experience a kind of oppressive sky and sort of a fluctuating, undulating notions of energy, which Munk wrote was very much how he experienced people, the landscape, the sky, the sea. And then that is one part. And then we come to an image of Hilma af Klint, a Swedish artist who has become very well known in the last few years. And what you can see here is, well, there are some geometrical figures you may be able to identify, uh, something that may look like flowers, but I don't think that even when you went strolling in an unusual place that you met this creature anywhere. So now we have gone from the realm of the recognizable people and landscape to what is felt, what is intuited as the order that is behind, behind it all. So how did the artists from many artists of the 20th century ended up justifying what they were doing? Because a number of them ended up uh, talking about 
uh, that their work was founded on what they knew about physics. So let me go to the next decision, uh, to the next, sorry, to the first main point, and that is the dissolution of matter. And one of the things is that with quantum mechanics and some of the new view of what reality is all about, you end up coming to the conclusion by a number of the most eminent foundational people that what we had a notion was matter, something concrete object that may be dissolvable if you put it in acid, but there was something concrete, that that is not the fundamental structure of reality. So a Nobel Prize winner, 1969, uh, biology, Max Delbruck, molecular biology, wrote, modern science has forced us to abandon absolute space and time. I will get to that in point three. Determinism, and I'll taste this one, and the absolute object, that is the object that is independent, that is not dependent on having been observed or measured. And of course, that goes immediately into the notion of for uh, particles to appear, they need to be in some way measured or observed. I won't get into that whole realm of what that means, but the notion is that they need to somehow interact with some type of measuring device. Werner Heisenberg said something similar, perhaps even more directly related uh, to uh, art. And he says, the common division of the world into subject and object. So this is my first point, the division into subject and object, inner world and outer world, body and soul is no longer adequate. So he ends up putting in very concrete terms that that notion that we were clear about what was mental or psychological and what was the real matter, that they are no longer adequate, that they are not absolute. So where do we find those ideas? In 20th century art or 21st century art? And let me start with, if you will, the clowns of 20th century art, the, or I should say the, anarchy, the anarchistic clowns the Dadaists. So Dada was a movement that preceded surrealism. It influenced it. It was um, very much going against all kinds of received notions about what proper art was or what art was. They created happenings where something unexpected may happen in an event. People may start just reading from newspapers, making noise, whatever. They were just trying to go against the received notion of what art was. And one of the two, besides Tristan Charan, one of the two founders of Dadaism, the two most important figures, was Hans Arp. And before you say it was all just for jest or just an anarchistic movement, read what he says about, again, the dissolution of the subject object, or in his case, nature and spirit. So Hans Arp, in a fairly mystical review quotation, he says, we longed for the clear flood, the holy letting go and letting be, which entwines, penetrates, suspends different things, life, states, events. We longed for the absolute, for the unpartedness of nature and spirit. So even that movement is considering whether we really can separate matters, whether there's absolute distinction. And let me go to the next one. František Kupka, a Czech, a Czech painter, one of the foremost creators of abstract art, that is an art where you are taking perhaps some aspects of representations of objects, but you end up uh, taking them farther and farther away from its source so that at the end you may not really be able to re-identify them. Well, František Kupka uh, worked as a medium, by the way. I will come back towards the end to the notion of artists as seers and mediums, but let me just mention that he would be in that list because as a young person, he worked as a medium. And here is a quotation by him. The artist could then make visible for the beholder the film of his rich, subjective inner world making unnecessary the current labor of producing a painting or a sculpture. So what Kuka is saying here basically is we should just eventually get rid of easel and paints and canvas 
because we will be able to just go directly into a transmission from the artist to the beholders, to the observers. I do not know if observer would be an appropriate word in this case, and just have a direct transmission of the subjective inner world of the artist. So that is one example, Dadaist, abstract art. And let me go now to another important movement in 20th century art, which again, most people would not easily think of as being related to uh, perhaps psychology or spirit or anything like that, but they were, and that was the fut futurism. And futurism was a movement that um, was centered in Italy. They were very interested in machines and what they saw as the future event, the future development. Uh, but in addition, and, and they were politically, they were very much on the right side. Uh, some of them pretty much leaning on the fascistic side. Uh, but they were also very interested in mediumistic phenomena. And so, if you look at this, one of the most famous sculptures of Boccioni, which is called Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, what you have there is a solid, well, what looks like a solid figure, but a figure that is spreading out. And if you think, mm, <coughs> this reminds me a bit of ectoplasm, of the medium's ectoplasm, where it would seem that there is something sort of half psychological, ethereal, not quite physical, spreading out, that is no accident. Because they were very much convinced that what the physical mediums were doing was to bring about that dissolution of matter into something that was halfway there. So a quotation from a treatise from not only Boccioni, but about five different futurists, they wrote, who can still believe in the opaqueness of bodies when our intelligence and increased sensitivity allow us to intuit the obscure manifestations of mediumistic phenomena? So direct reference to physical mediums and to that notion of uh, whatever you want to call it, subjective, spiritual or whatever, becoming somewhat physical. So that's the futurists. And this takes, and uh, let me let me start actually first with this painting by Vasily Kandinsky, 1935. And what he's trying to represent is in a way what he thought were concrete representation of thoughts and emotions. And these were some of the elements that he used in this painting. And in that, he was, to a large degree, following two theosophists, uh, Annie Besant and Lied Peter. And Lied Peter wrote a book called Thought Forms. And one of the drawings, one of the illustrations is right here. And what they proposed is that using clairvoyantly, and they directly said they were using psychics, that they were using psychics to find out what was the plastic color shape representation of thoughts and feelings. And he said, these thoughts and feelings are not just something that is in material. They do have specific concrete forms. And here's one of this. And I think this was, uh, if I recall well, like vehement emotion sort of going outwards. So you see thought forms in theosophists and in, in this case, Kandinsky in an abstract artist, sort of again saying there is no hard distinction between what is objective and what is subjective. One can turn into the other. So that was the first point I wanted to talk about, uh, that dissolution. But all these three main points are really interconnected. Uh, but I think for presentation purposes, it makes sense to separate them a bit. So the second point, and it happens with both physicists and artists of the 20th century, is the no and 19th century a bit, is a notion that there is a hidden 
interconnected order of reality. And for a number of physicists and physicists who were studying psychical research, who were doing research uh, in with mediums and so on, crook and so on, they proposed that there was an invisible substance that permeated the universe that was called the ether. And this, by the way, is not a proposal from mystics, New Age people. It was originally proposed by Sir Isaac Newton. And so they thought, well, how do things travel through space? And they proposed, well, there is a substance and some kind of substance that permeates the whole universe. There is no empty space, according to them. Now, the notion of the ether, that is a substance, not a field, a substance, something that may be uh, very solid, but still is a substance, <coughs> was refuted by a number of experiments. Perhaps the first most famous one was by Michelson and Morley in 1887. And so, well, the light is not behaving as if it were going through a substance. However, even though I do not believe that contemporary physicists would be now entertaining the notion of ether. There is another kind of notion that is entertained by contemporary physicists, and that is non-locality, entanglement. Here, I won't go into detail, but this year's, current, uh, this year's Nobel Prize went for people doing aspect type of experiments, and they have to do with the entanglement of particles, in which if you separate, if you, they were originally united, you split them and they separate, and they go to very different directions, they could go to different ends of the universe. Once you observe and thus end up establishing the characteristics of the particle at one point, the other immediately, without any time passing by, becomes also determined by what was done to the first entangled particle. So there is this, this notion that has been, for example, interpreted by the Spagna and the three people whom I mentioned some, uh, some uh, slides before, that there is no such thing as, no, as locality, that one way to interpret it is that even though we may experience things as very, very far away, well, they may not be they may be just in some way interconnected. And David Bohm, one of the uh, foremost theoretical quantum physicists, talk about the interconnectedness of the universe. And he said that in our perception, we end up experiencing an explicate order where objects are separate, where distances can be closer or far away. But David Bohm said, but underlying that, there is an implicate order in which those things actually do not happen. Those, the explicate order arises from that interconnected view of the universe. And I also like the, the very similar concept by Bertrand d'Espagnat of a veiled reality, which he says in the veiled reality where also somehow the whole universe is interconnected. And he wrote in the, his book, Physics and Philosophy, uh, that mystics and artists had a good apprehension of it. Not a physicist apprehension of it, but they had an intuition of it. So to quote the Spagna from uh, the Physics and Philosophy book, he writes, due to non-separability, the set real is what we end up experiencing the, uh, as real events in the world, may in no sensible way be considered constituted of localized elements embedded in space-time. So in the same idea that Heisenberg and so on have been talking about is there, but it is also found in artists. And we come to Kandinsky again, <coughs> the person whose, whose image I mentioned at the very beginning, and uh, Vasily Kandinsky wrote that book, very small book, concerning the spiritual in art, that again has been extremely or was extremely influ influential. It is still in press. Uh, people, modern artists continue reading it. I know I read it in Mexico uh, back a while ago. And what is interesting is that he is discussing ideas from physicists. So before the ether was no longer 
current in physics, the in a sort of ether transmission was discussed by physicists, eminent physicists who were also psychical researchers, such as J.J. Thompson, William Crookes, Oliver Lodge, and Balfour Stewart, who were talking about ether transmission. And then some of them would add it to a notion of a four dimension, that will be my next point, of the four dimension where what happened is that you could communicate through that other dimension and you communicated through it through different vibrations. So this idea that physics and parapsychology slash psychical research and art are interconnected is by no means something that I came up with. Uh, Linda Dalrymple Henderson, I have her there, has written a number of very interesting books where she has proposed that abstract art, cubism, and futurism were, had all their intellectual foundations in these ideas, ether transmission, four dimension, vibrations. And to quote how Kandinsky put it uh, in that little book, in which by incidentally in a footnote, at least in the edition I have from Mexico, uh, he quotes this Psychical researchers, Crookes, Lamarion, Lombroso, Richet, and Söllner, he writes, rhythm, color, and movement communicate a vibration through Hertzian waves translated into telepathy of emotions into a hyperspace. So here we come to the quotation that I said at the very beginning of the presentation, as was going to mention. So he thought that in his uh, image six that I showed at the beginning that that would communicate directly into the consciousness of the observer, of the audience, through Hertzian waves translated into telepathy or emanations in a hyperspace in which the observer was also there. And let me just spend a few seconds about the notion of Hertz. Now, the early part of the 20th century is also the time of the discovery of Hertzian waves radio, also x-rays, Röntgen rays, and so on. And the general idea that there are some waves that we cannot perceive, but are traveling and can travel enormous distances and can convey messages. So the idea that these artists were using was by no means nonsensical. They were taking something they were observing as happening and had taken that technology to try to explain how psychic phenomena or perhaps psychological phenomena occur. Now, I think nowadays we know that however, whichever psychic phenomena happen, they do not go through that channel, that it does not obey the type of um, um, speed that would be slower, that would take more time if you were at longer distances, that you can have um, Faraday cages that would end up blocking most electromagnetic waves, and you can still receive psychic information. So it does not seem to go through Hertzian waves or something like that, but the idea they were taking was by no means nonsensical. I think it was a clear derivation, something that one could expect easily. So we are talking now about transmission through space. That's Kandinsky. And here is uh, one image that I use in a paper, I was able to get the permission, and it's an embroidery. It's an embroidery by a woman, Jean Nathalie Vinch. Uh, this work is in Zurich, and what she calls it is I am radio. It's in 1933 or 1930. I cannot see because um, I have something blocking, but it's either 1923 or 33. Um, I have something blocking the, the age. But what is interesting is she calls this I am radio. And she's saying, well, I am receiving and sending these waves of information. And I am like a radio. And what she did in this embroidery, she did seven years before a book, a classic in parapsychological studies, which is Mental Radio by Sinclair, which was a, a study of the apparent telepathic transmission of the wife of Sinclair. Uh, and it's very much worth reading nowadays. So 
at least this person had that notion and probably that experience that she was like a radio receiving waves, messages from across the globe. So this is an example of an artist, a naive artist. And here is something closer to our days, a, con a concept art from Robert Barry, uh, and it's called A Telepathic Piece, 1969. And in this exhibit, what Barry did was to write first, well, I want you to think that there is a secret desire transmitted telepathically, a volitional state of mind, a particular feeling, a particular emotion, and the attendant to the gallery would keep on walking and seeing other exhibits and would not know until the end what was that was supposed to be transmitted. So he took the idea of Kupka, that an artist could just transmit directly what they wanted without having to put it into canvas or a clay or metal or whatever, and that it would come directly into the person. So that is an example. I do not know how successful or unsuccessful it was. Um, the only information I have, uh, I have been able to obtain is that this is the kind of information or um, instructions that he gave to the attendants. So that is an example, if you will, a telepathic piece. And uh, so I have so far talked about the dissolution of the subject and object, which makes them more easily to transmit subjective thoughts, emotions. The second part is that these may be transmitted. First, it was thought through the ether, but nowadays we may perhaps postulate that these may be somehow detectable through um, the quantum field or something that although not a substance may be, may be permeating the whole universe. Which brings us to the final point of interconnection, which is multiple dimensions. And these are multiple dimensions before the three geometric ones that we have, length, depth, and uh, breadth. And to discuss that, there may be, dim uh, there is of course the dimension of time that I'm going to address in a moment. But in addition to that, that there may be additional, for example, geometric dimensions that we are unable to perceive. This, this is an illustration from a classic book, Flatland. And uh, the idea behind it is that for inhabitants of a two-dimensional world, that is the world that would be depicted by that parallelogram, uh, what they may see as unconnected events, this dark spot, this dark spot, this dark spot, this dark spot, they see something that is happening, unconnected, we, they have no idea what it is. For someone who lives in three-dimensional space, they would be able to see that what is happening really is that all of these four events are connected because there is a person falling through that space. And hyperdimensionality is uh, something that was discussed earlier in the 20th century. It is discussed in the 21st century in string theory. And in the case of Psi, there is a proposal by physicist Bernard Carr uh, that is based on a hypergeometrical notion of reality. So now let's go to artists. What did they do with this idea of multiple dimensions? Let's first talk about time. Before getting into other geometric dimensions, let's talk about time. And one of the interpretations of Einstein's idea that time is not absolute for people in the same frame of reference. If there is one that is traveling at much, much uh, faster speed, time will end up going more slowly. And he uh, proposed, or at least one of the proposals, the block time model, is that instead of thinking that there is just one sliver of time in which you are going from moment to moment, that actually time is like a block where past, present, and future are all there at the same time. And even though we may not be able to perceive it, they are all there. Now, that idea uh, is very clearly depicted by cubism. And here is a very famous example, perhaps the one that made initially 
uh, Duchamp, very famous, and that is his painting of a nude descending, number two of 1912. Notice how early this is. And you are able to see, you may not be able to see very clearly that it is a nude, but what you can see is that this seems to be multiple images of the new descending as if you had the past, <coughs> what would be for us the past, the present and the future coexisting at the same time, being depicted at the same time. So that is uh, if you will, a perfect example of what the block time model would be like. And let me give you two other examples. One by the Russian painter Kazimir Malevich. This is here. You cannot see uh, in um, very clear detail, but even though it may be a relatively small image, you can still have a sense that what he's trying to depict is that there are many geometrical dimensions depicted in that painting. Um, it is, uh, I don't remember right now the name, but it's something like the knife something or other. You can, you can find it in the net if you want to know the exact title. And you have something very similar. And again, the image is rather smallish. So actually, I am sorry that I did not have just one slide for each one. But here in the Crucifixion by Hilma af Klint, uh, what you have is a Christ that is depicted in at least one, two, and three different geometrical planes. So she is, again, somehow in some way, disentangling the notion of one perspective where there is an absolute observer vanishing point of view into multiple geometric perspectives, sort of saying there are all of these coexisting forms or dimensions occurring at the same time. So that is an example of Hilma af Klint. Um, somebody mentioned Tom Ruffles, Georgiana Hutton. I'm not going to, I do not have anything of by her, but I know of her. So maybe in the question and comments, we can go back to her. So here are art and multiple geometric dimensions, early 20th century represented there. Coming to the next, the artist as seers and mediums. So now I won't be talking about physics, but I hope that I have been able to persuade you that there was an interconnection where ideas in physics were very often actually anticipated by artists having a similar idea that sometimes some artists like Kandinsky actually read physicists slash psychical researchers, and they were also informed by what they were writing and so on. So now let's talk about whether there is any notion, an idea that I will come back in the next to, la to last slide, whether artists could be considered as people who are able to see beyond the average, whether they can be mediums of that kind of other dimension where more information may be obtained. And uh, of course, Hilma af Klint, I end up talking a lot about her because I live in Sweden and I know quite a bit about her, enough not to recommend the new, the new film called Hilma, fairly superficial, uh, better read a good book about her. But here is what Hilma Clint did. She was a very successful uh, portrait artist. She was also very good at illustrating, painting flowers. She could have just continued doing that, but at some point she becomes part of a group of five women and one of them is a medium and is uh, receiving information, experiences receiving information from other realms, other spiritual forces. And Hilna Klint becomes suddenly even a stronger medium. And at one point she receives an idea that she has very strong images that she has to paint with the assistance of the other four people. And this is a quotation from her. The pictures were painted directly through me without any preliminary drawings and with great force. And if you have seen an exhibit, and there is one exhibit coming, I think, to either to London or to New York very soon. Um, if you see her work and you say, there was no preliminary drawings, there were no sketches, it is even more amazing because she's doing a type of work that was not being done at all. And something that I may say is that if you read, let's say, pre-2020 
history book of arts and you looked for under abstract art, you would find our uh, friend Kandinsky and a few other male artists as having initiated this movement. But actually, Hilma Clint had started doing these works a bit before them. And she had one exhibit of these paintings. It did not become very famous, but she had one exhibit of her work. So one could make the case that she was a pioneer and maybe had anteceded it. Now, to talk about Georgiana Hutton, it's really difficult to say who was first, because about a number of decades before Hilma Clint, there was another artist, Georgiana Houghton, I think I was to pronounce it, that was painting something that was very abstract and was again like forces or energies going through. Uh, so let's go to the next on artists as seers and mediums. And here is one example, one example of many, but this is for me perhaps the most striking example. This is a surrealist artist, Victor Brauner, and this is a self-portrait. And in the self-portrait, you can see that, <coughs> the, that he does not have an eye. He has an enucleated eye, the eye has popped out, which as you can see here, he has a glass eye. So you say, so, so what? But the interesting thing, and please think that even though this seemed to be in different sides, when he did a self-portrait, he had to look at the mirror. So the sides would be reversed that when he painted his self-portrait, both of his eyes were perfectly fine. Uh, he did not have a disease. He did not lose his eye because of some type of self-injury, but it was just a complete random and fairly stupid incident. He was in a bar. There were two other artists fighting with each other, and he tried to mediate between the two. And one of them ended up sending an ashtray who went straight into the corner of his eye and ended up popping out, popping it out, and they were not able to put it back. So when he painted this, his eye was perfectly fine. And he himself, it's not only people who later thought, well, maybe he had a, a precognition of what would happen. He himself thought that that was the case. And I have looked not in a scholarly way, but I have looked at a number of his portraits of uh, early portraits, and he had, he was a surrealist, he had unusual types of images, but I have not seen other figures that had this type of enucleated eye, just that self-portrait. Sort of so take it as you will, but that's a case that at least might be interpreted as being um, precognitive. There are other artists, Giorgio Chirito, Chirico, more contemporaneously gray in the US. Hilma A. Clint was known as a seeress, in his family and his her nephew in in um, his accounts of her describes how she was able in some dreams or so on to be able to seemingly anticipate something that happened in the future so we have anecdotes uh, and we have also reports and reports closer to our time so here we have two pairs of conceptual artists. First, Marina Adamovic, um, a Serbian artist, and this is Ule, with whom she was a partner, artistic and life partner for a number of years. And Marina Adamovic wrote, for example, that she has invested in becoming a telepath, in being able to control telepathy, and that it took her four years to do this, but that she was able to do it. Now, I do not know that she has been tested in any formal way, but that's what she maintains. And at the opposite, and Marina Ramovic, you might consider is very likely more to the political left or more um, anarchist and uh, free expression. And at the other spectrum, you have two other artists, conceptual artists, Gilbert and George from the United Kingdom, as right as you can get. But they also say that some of their work has come in a sort of telepathic way. Uh, so those are two examples. There are more, but I just wanted to mention that this is happening in our days. It's not something that people were proposing early in the 20th century. It just continues to occur. Uh, so you might say, well, those are experiences. In the case of uh, Browner, 
uh, you may say, well, that's an anecdote, sounds dramatic, but you cannot control the variables. But there have been studies in which people, uh, in which artists have ended up performing better than what you find in other groups. So, for example, in a paper by Dalton, 1997, uh, artists ended up uh, choosing correctly 40 to 75 percent of the time when the correct target should be chosen 25 percent. There is another paper by Merlin Schlitz that talks about that. Uh, Nicola Holt has written a very good paper on that, and we reviewed that in a 2012 paper that you can um, get from me if you send me an email. But overall, what has been found is that artists seem to be seem to do better, and sometimes quite a lot better in control side experiments than ordinary folk. So when they say or when they may feel that they are something like mediums or serious, that they need to be taken seriously. Uh, this is an example of artists have also tried to do sort of the telepathic experiments, if you will. And in this case, Russo said that he was trying to use a remote viewing, remote viewers uh, to try to be able to use that clay figure and see whether it might end up influencing what artists were doing. And this is one of the results of a person who ended up painting something that was inspired by this uh, painting that he could not see, Jeremy Miller. So again, this is not control. We do not know out of how many, but in her interpretation, there had been some kind of transmission. So that is an example, fairly recent, 2010. <coughs> Susan Healer, an internationally known artist uh, who died a few years ago, uh, did two or three experiments in we or two or three, I should say, artistic events in which she also tried to have some kind of collective telepathy events. So in one of them, uh, he asked people to sleep and dream on uh, a particular night and to have the intention of receiving some type of information. And she ended up writing in her handbooks that there had been some fairly striking hits. Now, to be honest, I cannot judge it. I just have the images. But she ended up doing a sort of halfway artistic event, halfway, if you will, parapsychology experiment, and at least found in her interpretation that something had come out of that. So this is, by the way, not that dissimilar, not as controlled, but not that dissimilar as what Stan Kribner was doing with the Grateful Dead concert and sending an image. So, uh, okay, great. We are coming good time to the last part of the presentation, which is talking of Psy as art. Psy phenomena, whether real or not, considered as art events. Uh, here's an example of a photography, a very dramatic photography. And there have been exhibits of photography, one which was uh, shown in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, in which these kinds of photographs were taken. Uh, this is from a collaborator uh, in Sweden, and she, some of her work ends up sort of try faking, if you will, levitating. So she was not actually saying that she had levitated, but she had uh, ended up concocting some photographic techniques to present this as her artistic work. So Psy has been used as art. That is an example. It has been exhibited in some of the most important venues of art in the world. Uh, I think inarguably the, uh, the most important comprehensive view of Psy and art was an exhibit called Cosa Mentale, uh, mental think in the Pompidou Center, which is one of the main, if not the main museum in Paris for modern art. And here, this was an exhibit all about telepathic art or what artists experience as telepathic art, uh, energy art, and so on. This was 2015, and there is a catalog for that exhibit. Not easy to find, but if you persevere as I did, you may be able to find a copy there. So there is that exhibit. And 
in Tate Britain against Susan Hiller in 2011. Tate Britain, one of the most important museums in the United Kingdom. She ended up exhibiting various works that had to do with ostensible psi phenomena. So this is not something that is unusual that happened only in the beginning of the 20th century or mid 20th century. It's still around us and there are a number of artists who take this very seriously. So before <coughs> opening this for questions, let me mention what I did not do, but what one could do. And I am basing myself to a degree on a book I read recently. Uh, it has some, the main gist of it, where uh, the author is talking about the relationship between art and physics is very good. When he gets into neurological speculations and so on, you can, you can skip those chapters. The ones about art and physics are very good. And the main proposal of this person who was not an art scholar, but who was a very well-read, very well-researched uh, neurologist, physician, is uh, summarized in the second quotation. And he's talking about revolutionary artists, meaning artists who end up coming up with new ideas, new forms of doing art. He says, And he does not only talk about 20th century onwards. He's talking all the way back to the beginners of perspective in the Renaissance. And he says, revolutionary artists have glimpsed a reality not visible to the rest of us. Prophets are those who speak of things before they come into being. They have space-time consciousness, knowing all at once. And he quotes approvingly this quotation by an art scholar, Russell, Australian art scholar. And he says, there is an art of clairvoyance for which we have not yet found a name and still less an explanation. So I would submit to you that the explanation to an extent, but what is missing for Russell and to an extent for Schlein is something in which parapsychology can contribute a lot. And that is that when people start talking, well, it looks like artists anticipated that some cubists were in some way anticipating uh, Einsteinian theory, where some artists were anticipating uh, quantum interconnectedness and so on, that that notion is something where at least parapsychology can say, well, this is a tenable hypothesis. It is not just completely out of the realm. It does not have to be supernatural. It is part of the natural realm, part of what we know about parapsychological or side phenomena. And we can contribute that. And one other important thing that I should mention is that the other thing that parapsychology can do, and which I attempted to do in one paper, which again, I can send to whoever is interested if you send me an email, my email address uh, will be shown in the next slide, is that part of why art scholars have missed the connection with psi and parapsychology is that they have lumped a lot of different things under the umbrella of the occult. So the author whom I know by correspondence, Linda Dalrymple, Henderson, for example, has very good papers and works, but she tends to dump believing in tarot, tarot cards, um, ended up practicing magic and so on, with psi phenomena, with psi ideas, with psi research. And what I tried to do in the paper I mentioned was to get rid, if you will, of the occult aspects of the tarot or the Kabbalah, or magic and just talk about ideas such as the possible transmission or being affected by somebody else's thoughts or emotions at a distance and not being bound by time. And that if you take those ideas, you find that they have been all around the development of art, at least from the beginning of the 20th century. So is there a place to go forward? And I would say if this is something that has interested you and um, 
And you may want to know, I, I founded recently the Journal of Anomalous Experience and Cognition, uh, and we have published three issues, and there will be a forthcoming special section on art and altered consciousness. So if you have expertise on both areas, do send me a proposal, send me an email. Also, if you're interested in the two papers I mentioned, one in which we review uh, literature, anecdotes, and experimental on artists as being able to, as being very psychic on the one hand, and then another paper in which I try to, in a sense, do what I did with this presentation, interconnect ideas of physics, parapsychology, and art, just send me an email to that address. And with that, I will open it to questions and comments. <coughs> now, thank you. I noticed that uh, um, somebody from Italy saying that there was an exhibit on surrealism and magic. And yes, of course, the surrealists were all over um, parapsychological phenomena and alterations of consciousness all over the place. So thank you for that. So, Elena, just um, do whatever you need to do to finish this and open it. Thank you. Thank <coughs> you so much for that wonderful talk. I would like to encourage the audience to enter their questions into the Q&A chat, please. And you can also have the opportunity, if you are camera ready, to uh, interact directly with Etzel here. I do see one question here from Carolyn Watt. Welcome, Carolyn. Uh, she says here, I'm going to show this on stage. Thank you, Etzel. Really interesting and educational. Regarding artists scoring well in GAN studies, you suggest this could be due to them being more psychic. What do you think about the idea that artists may be better able to verbalize impressions? <laughs> Well, Caroline, I, I think I could not uh, speculate any better than you could, uh, probably quite a bit worse. Um, I think it is not only a matter of verbalization, to be honest, because of the kind of activities that, let's say, visual artists or even musicians engage in much more than most people do. So, for instance, if I am a manual worker, uh, I have to be very careful and focus on my perceptual events. Look at where my drill is, look at where my hands are, and not lose focus of it if I want to keep all of my hands, you know, healthy. So that's what they are working on. Uh, an academic, you may end up spending a lot of time reading articles, maybe making notes, writing, and sort of a lot of it is outbound, conceptual and or perceptual. Whereas in the case of some artists, what they are focusing on more is what are they feeling? Do they have images? Are they able to somehow, in some way, develop those images into something that may that could be conveyed in a happening or a painting or a sculpture? So I think that they end up spending more time and they may have a propensity to do that in focusing on their inner experience than the rest of us do. Uh, and this, this would be consistent with, I know it's, uh, it's not straight uh, um, evidence that, it is, that there is, uh, it is not completely corroborated, but at least in some studies where you find that people who seem to be more likely to become absorbed or more hypnotizable, that when they are in an altered state, they end up performing better. What does that mean? They are not artists, let's say, in, in the studio, two studies that we did. Uh, they were not with artists. They were just highly hypnotizable people. But when they were in an altered state, they typically end up talking more about images. So one other way of talking about, let's say, hypnotizability or absorption or um, openness to experience is that people are less into conceptual matters. They are less into just perceptual subject-object distinctions, and they may be more connected into what they experience and take that and develop it more. So I think that it is not only a matter of verbalization, but you, I, I can be corrected by you, of course, any day, Caroline. <laughs> and Caroline adds, 
Um, yes, maybe it's a bit like people who take part in mental disciplines like meditation. Sure, sure. <laughs> it, it will be the same thing. Someone else uh, building on this asks um, Laura Adkerson. Here's her question. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. I was curious if your presentation relates to musicians as well, or are you just referring to visual artists? Well, the presentation was just on visual artists, but the little bit where I talk about experiments, controlled experiments in parapsychology, uh, one of those studies, the one by Merlin Schlitz and other people, uh, one of the subgroups was Juilliard School musicians, and they were the ones who did the best. So um, what we're talking about is that this seems to work as well with musicians or music students. Thank you. Sorry, I keep going back and forth. It takes a minute to come back. Um, yes, I was just reflecting on this whole left brain, right brain dominance and your, you know, accessibility to the altered states of consciousness, which I think is quite interesting. Um, Peter also writes, uh, Peter Mulatz, welcome, Peter. Excellent talk, Enzo, similar to one you gave in Vienna a few years ago. Let me focus on the last slides where you showed a black and white picture where a light structure like a beam or a lightning is seen between the hands of the medium. And uh, perhaps he has a second part of his talk. Here we go. The real phenomenon is the ectoplasmic structure on the head of the medium, photo by shrink. No training. Uh, that's a mistake. Nothing. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, Peter. Uh, this is in a yes. I remember you. You invited me to do this. I have ended up knowing more, and I have expanded a bit more what what I did for you back in Vienna. Uh, so my ignorance has decreased somewhat, uh, at the same time as my realization of how much more I do not know. Uh, but yes, it is a further development of the presentation I gave. And, and you know, of course, uh, you, one could have a presentation just on exhibits on photography and how photography was strict and changed and so on. The third, the third piece of Peter's question is that the light between the hands is due to a failure of the film cartridge. Uh, yeah, and, and I would say... Sure, I know you will find that many of those are failures or were actually tricked and so on. Uh, uh, but the, the interesting for me, the point of showing it was to point out that those photographs are are being used as art objects, as subject to and worthy of artistic exhibits. So that was the gist of that. Thank you, Peter. Please uh, add your questions into the Q&A. We have uh, lots more time for Q&A here. I was actually curious, Etzel, about your thoughts of precipitated art. It's a little bit different than your talk today, but I'm wondering if you have anything that you'd like to share with the audience about precipitated art. Uh, I do not know what that is, <laughs> so tell me, please. Yes, so that is a unique uh, physical mediumship phenomenon where uh, a physical medium um, essentially directs the intention to precipitate art on a canvas and the um, perception from their perspective is that the spirit world is precipitating these art works okay. on the canvas. They just manifest on this canvas. And, you know, these have apparently been documented by people witnessing it. Um, yeah. And, yes, do you have anything you want to share about that? Uh, almost nothing. Uh, but, I, yes, I know now what you mean. The Gasparetto in Brazil, for example, who yeah. was able to paint even with his feet and so on. Um, the almost the very little that I know is that um, the same 
thing as with Rosemary Brown, that there has not been, at least in the case of people who say they are channeling other artists, that the quality of the art varies tremendously. So, for instance, there is a, a moment in the mediocre film of Hilma Clint, uh, where she's talking about, well, what happens with, in your terms, would be precipitated art, in the art that I'm going to mediate, that will come through me, of the spirits of the masters. What? Yes, it could be great, but then they mention somebody else. They mention Josephson, Ernst Josephson, uh, the grandfather of the famous Berman uh, actor, and he was a well-recognized artist, and then he, according to the, the archives, or according to history, uh, became psychotic, or at least very, very strange. And then he started saying that he was mediating art from Rafael, Rafael Sancio, and so on. And I have seen some of that work, and it's dreadful. So you can say, well, if... <laughs> That is Rafael Sancio. Then I can do a Rafael Sancio because I can put two lines and say that from him. <coughs> so um, I think what might work is that if you have a person who may not have, let's say, the initiative to come up by herself or himself with art that says it's mine or it's coming from me, that having some sense that I am just a medium, it's passing through me, that that may allow some people to express something they might not have been able to express. And I'm going now to move into music for a moment. In the case of Rosemary Brown, uh, who was uh, who came up with an LP or two, was recorded by a very good pianist, and she said that she was channeling works from Chopin and Schumann, I think, and Liszt was another one. And people were saying, well, how could she have done it? How could she have composed? She was, quote unquote, just a housewife. And I think that is very problematic because it goes to our dreadful bias and prejudice of the notion that unless you went to the conservatory, unless and unless you were a male, usually, you could not come up with that, with something. It had to, if, uh, just a housewife could not have come up with something that was impressive, maybe not at a genius level, but still very impressive, better than the vast majority of people. And I think that very likely what she was able to come up with is impressions that came out of her non-conscious mind, it, as most art or a lot of art seems to come from, it seemed to come from not something that she was deliberate or aware of. It came through, and in her case, it, it helped that she experienced it as coming from an actual composer that she was in touch with. But I think the same way that people can have some extraordinary abilities to, for instance, uh, have a perfect ear and so on, I think that there may be some people who have just an extraordinary ability to reproduce with small modifications what some other people have done. And perhaps, I'm not sure, she's dead, there's no way to study her, but perhaps Rosemary Brown and other people are somewhere along these lines. And some of the precipitated art who is saying, well, I am channeling this artist or that artist, are people who have seen a work and are able to come up with something that it's impressive, but not necessarily something that ends up being evidential of some spirit communicating through them. So those are my two Thank very you. Thank you. Thanks for that. And yes, Carolyn, what that what we are speaking of would would be called channeling per se. I recently <laughs> learned about precipitated is a little bit different. It actually is art that manifests on a canvas without anybody touching it. So essentially oh, people are right. sitting in a room and it just manifests like, and I've never witnessed it myself. So uh, I just recently learned about it and it sounds quite fascinating to me. So I was curious if you know anything about that. Okay, sorry. So I was way off mark. I know nothing. <laughs> you know. If, if somebody can come up with okay. uh, 
any evidence of that happening, uh, I will be extremely impressed and it should be very important. But yeah. no, I know nothing about it. Yes, yeah. I'm hoping to go attend some of those um, on the East Coast in the next six months or so. So I'll report back to everybody how it goes. We have a few more uh, questions here. Uh, Marcus Meyer asks, thank you, Etzel, for this inspiring talk. Uh, sorry, cut off here. The relation between arts and science, is it precognition or based on the fact that both are creative in the sense they create a specific worldview? Uh, well, I would phrase it a bit slightly differently, Marcus, and I think I think I am in agreement with the general notion of Schlein and the, the artist critic he was talking about that artists seem to be fairly sensitive to, if you will, the, the general spirit of the time. And as things are changing, as ideas or views about the world or conceptions of the world are about to change or the old ways are falling down, that artists may be able to have some sense of that and express it in in their work. So you would say not create a specific worldview, but create something specific through their medium in which they are reflecting something that is happening, which will later on be uh, formalized through mathematical rigors and equations and so on by physicists. So there, I think that is a large part of it. Uh, now, I think that there may be something as well to some sort of precognition, given the evidence that we have from laboratory side. So I think there is also some of that. But even leaving that aside, I think that what happens, and some artists have mentioned it, is that artists are like the, the consciousness of the time, the consciousness of the culture, and they are able to perhaps have a sense of things before they are about to, before other people become aware of them just because of their greater focus and attention on what they are experiencing and what they are feeling. Thank you. Our next question is from Camila Pagani. Impressive talk, thank you. Just one question. Don't you think that like Hilma at Clint, Michelangelo might have said that the pictures were painted directly through him when he depicted the Sistine Chapel? No idea. I don't, you know, I have read some books uh, about Hilma Clint. Uh, I haven't read anything by Michelangelo, so I have no idea how he expressed what was happening. I, I have a sense that, no, I, I better just shut up with that. I really do not know how he experienced what was coming. I mean, he had to plan things well in advance to work at the Sistine Chapel, uh, with the painting coming on. I remember that he did complain that the painting would be coming over his eye, his face, and so on. So he planned it a lot. But what came before the planning, I have no idea. What, how he experienced it, I do not know. <laughs> Thank you. Next question we have is from Laura Adkerson. With Russo's remote viewing art that you shared, do you know if his art was correlated with crop circles? Remote viewing art is fascinating. Yeah, uh, no idea, no idea. Um, I just found that that bit in one of the books and uh, added because I like the images, but no, I do not know. Okay, no problem. Next uh, question is from Mike Bova. Thank you for a fantastic talk. Ted Cirrus was not a, an artist and was able to create images on film templates. Probably not in line with your talk, but he was image making. Any thoughts on this? Uh, well, this I can say something about. Not not a whole lot, and not necessarily anything intelligent, but I can say something about this. And uh, that is that. Um, and I think the Ted Sears case needs to be taken seriously. Um, my friend Stephen Brody has written extensively about this and has debunked some of the debunking. Uh, so in the case of Ted Sirius, if, if indeed things happen as, as they seem to happen, that he was able to impress uh, Polaroid, page, uh, Polaroid events. So this would go into the first 
point that I was talking about, the idea that the, the frontiers between the subjective and objective are not absolute. And in his case, for whatever reason, you might think that he was able to somehow exteriorize his images or emotions into something that could be easily moldable, like a Kodak template. So that is what I can see a, a relation. And of course, <clears throat> I'm not going to, to vouch for ectoplasm, but if there, if there were some good ect, you know, ectoplasm that could be thought as fairly evidential, it would be the same thing. The notion that somehow you were able to exteriorize, to make somewhat objective that was coming out of your subjective experience. Incidentally, uh, there is one, one study I can think of of uh, an out-of-body experience. This I don't remember right now. The authors probably Caroline may remember and, and tell us, or maybe Nancy, uh, in which a person who could have out-of-body experiences at will was able to impress and change strain gauges, which are extremely sensitive. Uh, so this wasn't only just having sort of experience of your body floating, but it seemed to somehow be able to affect a physical system. So this would be somewhat similar, only in the case of Ted Sears, this was some degrees more intense than what you would find in that study. Thank you. We have time for a few more questions. Uh, if, if anyone else any last questions. Uh, we have one here from uh, Miguel Bowie who says, thank you mm -hmm. for an enlightening presentation. I wonder, does the process of generating certain forms of art represent a thinning of one's boundaries or do artists naturally possess thinner boundaries? If so, which types of artists might be more predisposed, predisposed and which types of art? Sure. Uh, gracias, Miguel. Uh, and Miguel has a very nice profile on Rex Stanford, which is in the current issue of the Journal of Anomalous Experience, which you can get for free also if you send me an email, I'll send you the link. Um, yes, Miguel, uh, the notion of mental boundaries, which was created by Hartman, Ernest Hartman, um, is partly based on his research has shown very clearly that artists need to have thinner boundaries. And by what, what we mean by mental boundaries <coughs> is a notion of how much you see yourself as encapsulated in your body and your concepts as being just set, cast on stone, or whether you may experience your body boundaries and your emotions being more malleable, more flexible, and maybe being able to go into different states easily. Uh, so in this case, uh, what, uh, what I could say is that, yes, artists in their work by Hartman and others do show thinner boundaries, but I would not say all artists, because you're also asking, well, which type of artists? And, uh, you know, I do make differences. There, is, there are some conceptual artists uh, that I think do not get at all into their experience, contrary to what I mentioned to Caroline Watt. Um, uh, to be honest, I think they are thinking, well, what is fashionable? What will get me a lot of money? There's one famous artist whose name escapes me. Thank God, so I won't be uh, sued. But, uh, you know, who those things, I don't think coming out of some type of inner urge or inner experience. And I don't think they would necessarily have any thinner boundaries than anybody else. But for those who are thinking, having sense, having sense of, I have, uh, I'm going to work with colors, and I want to find out which is the exact color for my emotion. These people are blurring the boundaries between sense percepts, between different types of sensory modalities, or they're uh, blurring the boundaries between where their body is and where other bodies is and so on. So I would say that the artists that are more working for or focus on their inner experiences would have thinner boundaries uh, and other artists that do not do that would not. And I see that Nan, uh, Nancy Singrone came with the answer to 
uh, to the to the issue about the strain gauges. The research was by Alex Danos and Carly Sosses. Yes, Carly Sosses was one of them, I remember. Uh, so check OSIS and you will find that story. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. And uh, we are out of time for uh, our formal Q&A here. I'm just wondering, Etzel, if you have any final words you would like to offer our audience, um, <coughs> of, you know, celebration of this career award before we move into our social time. Yes. Well, um, that is an easy one. Well, two things. The first one is, uh, I think that one can make the case that parapsychology can help us deepen and explain cultural history. So, for example, what I try to do with this presentation and with the paper that is related to it is to say this actually amplifies what we know about abstract art and futurism and conceptual art and surrealism and so on. So. It is not only about parapsychology being able to illuminate uh, research methodology, something that Caroline Watt has written about, or the actual um, object of its studies to look at evidence, but it can also illuminate cultural history. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, the most important one, is that it's time for me to go and take care of my masterwork, which is about to be four years of age. So uh, I will leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Thank you, audience, for joining us today. We will now move into uh, informal social time, and uh, we appreciate you being here with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>